Good afternoon and welcome to very special Dean Circle edition of the Scope Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nicole Wadsworth, Dean of the New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine. It's my sincere honor and privilege to be on location at the United States White House in Washington, D.C., with a very special friend of NYT College of Osteopathic Medicine. Please welcome retired Army Colonel, esteemed NYT Com alumnus, advisory board member, and United States physician to the president, Dr. Kevin O'Connor. Thank oh. you. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Connor. The hey, honor's mine. Today, our conversation with Dr. O'Connor will include highlights and insights regarding his extraordinary medical career, as well as his White House appointments beginning in 2006 and spanning three presidential administrations. We'll also discuss Dr. O'Connor's vision regarding the practice of medicine, military medical care, medical education, and how future physicians can best pre prepare themselves during this dynamic time of technological advancement, innovation, and change. Thank you, Dr. O'Connor, for meeting with us today. I'm truly honored to be here. Thank you so much for your generosity and your extraordinary hostmanship, <laughs> uh, taking us around the White House today and the Eisenhower Building. It's been truly an incredible experience. And lunch was amazing, too. <laughs> Before we start our conversation, I'd like to provide our listeners with a few uh, highlights from Dr. O'Connor's amazing medical career. As a U.S. Army family physician, flight surgeon, hyperbaric medical officer, and medical educator, Dr. O'Connor has served in clinical, academic, leadership, and operational assignments throughout his incredible 30-plus-year 30 30 year career. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> um, so, Dr. O'Connor, I'm going to kick off a little bit. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your educational journey um, to, to, that would help the listeners understand where you've been? And sure, sure. Well, I uh, public school education. You know, uh, I grew up in Titton Falls, uh, New Jersey. Went to Monmouth Regional High School. Uh, had a great time there. Uh, from there, went to St. Bonaventure University undergrad and uh, you know, gave me a good uh, broad uh, Franciscan based um, you know education you know that I think was really formative uh, small school only about 2,000 students there you know uh, my wife teases me that you know uh, my sister and I were like half the, the population yeah <laughs> you know but I had a great time at St. Bonaventure learned a lot about life uh, which I think is uh, way more important than learning about books and uh, and then from there discovered this uh, New York College of Osteopathic Medicine and uh, now uh, NYITcom yeah, you know, when NYT realized that their you know, biggest college was giving them no marketing uh, abilities, <laughs> yeah, nobody knew what Nikon was. So I, uh, I get it, you know. And so, um, so did that. And then uh, I was uh, on an ROTC scholarship undergrad and an HBSB scholarship uh, for medical school. So I paid for school was through the Army, and uh, the deal is they pay for school, you owe them time. And so uh, I knew at that point I owed them eight years, and so I was looking forward to uh, military residency. And then I end up uh, getting a civilian residency uh, at the Mountainside Hospital in New Jersey. I did a third program called the FAP, the Financial Assistance Program, uh, through the Army. And so I ended up uh, coming in as an 03 under two in rank, you know, less than two years, owing 12 years. And, uh, but in my mind, you know, they paid me up front. So uh, it, it was a good deal. And so, um, so I started down at Fort Bragg. Yeah, ended up having, um, you know, Craig, you know, started to mention uh, there uh, a bunch of different jobs. Uh, in the beginning, I was uh, in um, in the clinic. Yeah, then I started teaching uh, in the residency program, and uh, from there, uh, got into operational medicine, the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, then uh, you know, small special missions unit, and uh, known uh, colloquially as Delta Force. Uh, I was the deputy surgeon and the command surgeon there. Uh, and that's when the global war on terror uh, kicked off. And then um, from there out to Fort Carson uh, to do um, after command at General Staff College and then uh, end up uh, having a fateful consult and, uh, and a couple you know, steps later end up here at the, at the White House for uh, during the pre President Bush administration. Uh, and then I was going to do six months with uh, then Vice President Biden and um, that didn't work out. And so I ended up doing the whole eight years uh, with him. Uh, and then uh, then I retired. I had a plan, you know, and uh, and here I am again. So, 
Yeah. Wow, that, that's phenomenal. So I'm going to go back to something that you shared. Can you tell us more about the fateful consult? Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah the way it works here is we, we have uh, one you know, guy who's the, what we call the P2P, the physician to the president. And then uh, we have, uh, back then there was six, now there, you know, we have a total of 10 of us that are uh, White House physicians. And uh, you know, they cover every, you know, we have a physician of the president, a physician of the vice president, and then everyone else is kind of plug and play. You know, uh, they'll cover you know, vice president one day, president the next day, uh, nights, you know, weekends, trips, all that stuff that has to be covered that you know, one person never, never could do and wouldn't want to. And, uh, and so uh, it's a great team. And so at that point, I was one of those um, plug and play guys. Yeah, so I think I covered President Bush maybe two thirds of the time, Vice President Cheney, um, you know, one third of the time in the beginning. But before that, I was at Fort Carson. I was their, um, their chair of family medicine. And I had a buddy of mine, uh, Dan Parks, was here as one of the White House physicians. And uh, General Tubb, I think, was a physician of the president for, uh, you know, for President Bush. And, uh, and so Dan called me and said, hey, do you still do that, you know, that osteopathic stuff, you know, the, the back stuff? You know, because I had kind of gotten a reputation for that when I was in special operations, you know, because uh, you know, the equipment, you know, it's, it's lightweight, you know, it's self-propelled, it's thermoregulated, you know. And so, uh, you know, whether it's a desert floor or, a, you know, you know, top of a box or an actual table, you can manip- and manipulate it and uh, soldiers like that. And so, uh, so I said, yeah, Dan, I, uh, I still practice the black arts. You know, I, I still heal with violence. And so, uh, and so he said, well, I, I guess I was hoping that you could, could see. And so uh, I said, sure, I'm, I'm off on Monday. I'll come on up and, and see you. The president was gonna be in Denver and I was in Colorado Springs. And so, um, so I went up and uh, mostly I was honestly looking forward to seeing uh, my friend Dan and having beer. Uh, I assumed he had some secret service friend or somebody like that. Uh, it ends up uh, that the patient was President Bush, and, and I can see that because he he talked about it. Otherwise, I you know, would worry about privacy, you know. But uh, but he, uh, he he made actually quite a show of it, you know. <laughs> I, in, in due course, my uh, my nickname you know, originally was Bone Crusher, you know. Uh, you know, but he was not shy about letting people know he you know liked getting this done, and uh, and so I went up there and as the patient Dan had in mind was was President Bush, and so uh, so I met him and could have been Mr. President and uh, you know, get on the table, and, uh, and I went right to work and um, yeah I was pretty direct and he was pretty direct and and then the next time they were in Denver they asked hey can that you know little guy from Fort Carson come see me again, and uh, of course and uh, and then the third time they said hey maybe you know you want to you know, maybe start rolling with us full time. And, uh, and so I interviewed with a, a couple uh, really, really talented people, good friends of mine uh, from the Uniform Family Ser- Family Physicians Group, and uh, and they ended up offering me their O's, and um, and so I started out here at the White House. Well, that, that's an amazing story. That's so incredible. Um, so so I'm going to sort of go back a little bit. Um, after that, and I'm really curious about when did your interest in medicine really start? The womb. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I really, uh, I, I don't have that many tricks. Uh, I, uh, there's not a whole lot that I'm that good at. Uh, and medicine just happens to be something I, I yeah, have an act for and I, I really never consider anything else. Uh, if I had not gotten into school, which is a very real possibility, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think I would have been an army ranger. You know, my backup plan was infantry. Great, great. Um, so what experiences during medical school at, at uh, NYITCOM really influenced your career? The, well, family medicine then as a choice, uh, I think the credit you know, slash blame for any of that could be uh, you know, definitely set up with my rotations. Uh, and the, the problem is that we had so many good uh, clinicians in those clinical years. You know, you had your foundational you know, classes that you took, uh, but I didn't learn that much medicine. I learned the, the facts I need to, to learn medicine from you know, the first two years. And uh, I think one of the strengths of NYTCOM that hasn't changed is we don't have our own hospital. And I think that's great because it forces you to go out in the world and see a lot of different uh, medical enterprises and have an unbelievable stew of, uh, of attendings uh, and, and residents, you know, and, and different schools. And, and so my training was throughout Brooklyn and Queens and, you know, uh, a whole bunch of different hospitals. And, uh, and I think the, the, the problem is that I liked everything. 
Mm. You know, and so I didn't find anything that I that I loved so much that I was willing to give the other stuff up. You know, so that was part of it. And, and I, I really think that the, the model of that kind of education led to that because I got to rotate with all kinds of specialists who really liked what they were doing. And they weren't just gurus in that one medical enterprise. And so, um, you know, every time I did a rotation, I, and I recommend to my students today, if you're doing a rotation, you should really envision yourself, is this the life, you know, not the job, this is this the life uh, that I want to lead. Uh, and, and I advise them, you know, look at your attendings and see if they seem happy. Yeah, see if they mm -hmm. seem fulfilled. And uh, it, that's a big clue. Yeah. And then at the end of third year, when you've done your rotations, go back to your family, your friends, uh, people that have been around you and, uh, and just uh, ask them to reflect. Yeah, to say, hey, yeah, when, when was I okay to be around? Yeah, when did I seem uh, happy? Uh, when did I seem like a kindergartner? And then you know, when I say that, when the kindergartner comes home from school, they're just so excited to be learning something. They can't wait to tell you about their day. You know, and, you know, if you ask your friends, your family, your parents, whoever, you know, when was I like that? You know, when did I want to share my day with you? Or when did I, was I pretty miserable? That's probably going to tell you what your specialty should be. That, that's yeah. phenomenal advice. And, and I, would, I hope um, medical students can hear that. Training in community-based settings, and that's my bias, certainly. I, I think those are some of the best training opportunities. And I love the, the advice about having your family and your friends reflect back yeah, to you when, when you seemed happiest. Yeah, when was I like a kindergartner? Mm -hmm. that's, that's wonderful. So, so working in the White House, really amazing. We've been walking around today seeing the incredible sights and, and the, the architecture, everything. It's just so, it's sort of awe-inspiring for, for me. What, what's your average work day look like? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely no average. Um, yeah, the, the, the biggest secret that I would have, uh, I'm in my, you know, 14th year of my three-year tour, you know, so I, I, yeah, I guess I cannot figure it out. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the biggest thing I, I think is the day that you're walking around here and uh, you feel like I belong here. You don't. Yeah, we're stewards. Um, I can smell that in other officers in the first hour or so. Uh, if, if you think that you should be in these halls, you should not be in these halls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, uh, and the other thing I tell people when they're coming to work here. Uh, given the mission we have, you know, which you know, concert with the Secret Service to you know, provide safety and, you know, um, and security for the, for the president, the vice president and their families, uh, is I don't want you to feel comfortable ever. You know, I want you to be a little bit nauseated every time you, you drive in. And, uh, and, and, you know, ask folks around me, they'll, they'll tell you, I, I'm not just saying that. You know, uh, certainly when you're going through the ritual of, you know, getting dressed, putting the earpiece in, you know, that, that should be like in the military when you're putting body armor. You know, you're like, we're getting ready to leave this 18 acres of safety. Uh, that, that's the equivalent of, you know, you we're getting it on, you know, and, uh, you know, you never were, use the word just around me. Uh, we're never just walking through the kitchen. You know, Bobby Kennedy's just walking through the kitchen. Yeah, it's never just a motorcade. Uh, everything's important. There's no just. You know, and so uh, in that sense, you got to be wrapped a little crazy tight, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that's, yeah, average, average is never feeling comfortable. You know, I, uh, I tease the uh, new docs that come in, new PAs and uh, nurses. Yeah, I always, you know, welcome here and, you know, make sure they're comfortable, make sure they know where Home Depot is on that. And then uh, and I ask them, you know, you ever have one of those days that you're, you're driving to work and you're like, man, the sun's out, the, you know, it's a beautiful weather and, yeah, man, this is gonna be a great day. You know, uh, I ask him, please turn around and go home because I don't want you near me. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're, we are not in the great day business. Yeah, we're in the worst day of your life business. And the one thing I can promise you is if you ever actually do what we're paying you to be prepared to do is it will be on camera and literally the whole world is gonna uh, second guess how you did it. You know, so no pressure. No average, sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> so looking back on your military medical career, is there a specific time or event that really stands out as an exceptional period of growth or learning for you? Uh, well, physical growth, definitely retirement. <laughs> um, but no, uh, learning, shoot, yeah, every, uh, every day along the way. I mean, the, 
the, the best opportunities for growth were the bad days. Um, you know, I, I always, when I do a promotion ceremony at the end, I think it throws the families off a lot. Uh, but I always say my one wish for you is uh, adversity. Because uh, that's when you're going to find yourself. You know, if you always have great easy day, you always have great weather, people always like you, uh, you never have to make a call that's controversial. You're never going to define yourself as a person, as an officer, as a man, as a woman. You, know, you just won't define yourself. And so um, how you define yourself is how you take your lumps. You know, uh, but if you don't get punched in the face, you'll never know how to do that. And so, um, so I'd say, you know, the tough days were the, were the formative ones. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. A lot of learning happens when you make a mistake or, oh, yeah. or things don't go your yeah. way for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I make like 10 a day. And so <laughs> I learn a lot. Yeah. So thinking about, you know, just the dangers and, and I know you prepare for the worst case scenario that's always on your mind. Um, and, and you want to be prepared, but you don't want it to come. What um, can you offer any advice on how to sort of maintain yourself during those times, but you know, move forward in a positive way? Uh, keep smiling. You know, I always tell people we we have to be working, but we don't have to be sucking. That's a choice. Uh, and so, uh, tell jokes. You know, uh, laugh. You know, uh, keep a positive outlook. Uh, love your patients. You know, uh, don't be afraid to love your patients. You know, uh, medicine is so easy to get, especially like real doctors that are in clinic and getting beat down. Life is a door full of charts. I mean, that's easy to get burned out. And, um, you know, when, back when I was a real doctor doing that stuff, uh, the way I got through the day is I just, every time I closed the door, that person in front of me was my only attention. Uh, and, and I'd get to know them. I mean, what, yeah, you know, what kind of job in the world is it that you get paid to make friends? I mean, if, if you can't make a friend and you're a doctor, you can't make a friend. I mean, people are going to inherently share things with you they don't share with anybody. And, uh, and, and you know, you're going to help people. You, it, it'd be hard to go through a day and not help people meaningfully. You know, and that's just if you're doing the bare minimum. So if you do a little bit more than the bare minimum, actually allow yourself to be part of this person's life and maybe even let them to become part of yours and actually become friends with your patients, that's not hard, you know, because then you're only taking care of your friends, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and so I say, look, you know, you're gonna have all these people in your training that tell you, um, you know, maintain separal, separation, you know, professional guarding and all that, you know, don't be too close to your patients. And yeah, and I say this a lot in commencement addresses. And I, yeah, so, so spoiler alert, I, I'm going to say this if I ever do a commencement address. <laughs> yeah, but it, it really is a, in my philosophy on life is that um, don't be afraid to love your patients. You know, uh, you're going to have all these people saying, oh, you keep your distance. You know, you, know, you don't want to be uh, affected. Of course you do. You should be affected. Now, you should not be incapacitated. You know, uh, if something bad happens to your patient, you don't want to be the person over in the corner sucking their thumb and crying. But, you know, you should take on small portions of your patient's suffering. And, uh, and in doing so, you're going to take on small portions of their joy, too. And, uh, and it's just a matter of mathematics. Uh, if, you know, if you look at it that way, that pain shared is pain divided. Mm. Joy shared is joy multiplied. You know, they're both logarithmic. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so if you be the source of that joy, you know, um, you know, you figure you get a headache, I get a headache. We don't go to the doctor for it. You know, so if that little lady comes in for a headache. Maybe they're there for something else. Maybe that's the, the only social, you know, uh, thing they get to do. And that, that shouldn't be seen as a waste of your time. That should be seen as an opportunity. And, you know, mm -hmm. so don't be afraid to to hug your patient. Yeah, you know, that's ridiculous. Yeah, what if that's the only hug in that patient's life? Right. Right. Well, good. again, great advice. As a as an emergency physician, I learned really on and early on in my training that it's their emergency. And and although I watched emergency physicians get frustrated about why somebody might be there right. that day, um, taking on that attitude really changed my practice life. So sure, great advice. Many of your publications and public speaking engagements have addressed um, point of wounding care on the battlefield. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah, that's the um, point of wounding is uh, care under fire. Uh, 
Okay. You know, uh, and so it's the it's the point at which the patient sustained the wound, and so uh, very likely the fight is still going on. And so the things that might be the right answer if you're in a well lit room with no threat uh, are definitely not the right answer when you're in the dark in the middle of a firefight. And so um, you know, we you know, many years ago you know formed this committee, this uh, you know committee on tactical combat casualty care. Um, and the, the reason we did that is because you know, ATLS, you know, that the American College of Surgeons had put out, was very appropriate for civilian-based EMS, certainly urban-based, where you know you're within minutes of an OR. Uh, but many of the practices were not appropriate for uh, for care under fire. Uh, I mean, you start with anything that makes a light it just got you all killed, yeah, you because know, we fight at night, and you know, and so you open a laryngoscope, and that just cost the whole team, you know, and so um, you know, so you're not going to do that. And, and you know, or, you know, tourniquets, for instance, you know, now civilians have you know, gotten on board. They are all on board with the tourniquets save lives. Uh, but when we started out, there were, you know, thousands of, uh, of soldiers in Vietnam that uh, they died in an autopsy. Their only wound was uh, an isolated extremity wound. And uh, a simple tourniquet would have, would have preserved them easily, mm. you know, easily. And so that was the, the first, you know, kind of windmill to, to tilt. And, uh, and then we went on to, you know, pain control in the battlefield, uh, and, you know, pointing out that, you know, if you're a fan of, uh, of uh, intramuscular morphine, you would have loved uh, Bull Run and Gettysburg, you know, because that's what they used in those battles. And, um, and, and so just looking for opportunities to kind of advance things um, for, the, for the soldiers that are in the middle of the fight, you know. Well, moving forward from Gettysburg a little bit, <laughs> in the last two decades has been a time of rapid change um, in technology and medical care. In your opinion, how, how has this impacted medical profession at large? And what are some of the positive and or pressing challenges um, you anticipate? Yeah, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm definitely, I don't have expertise in, in uh, technology and medicine, but uh, I got a taste of it, as did everyone during the, you know, the uh, pandemic. And uh, there's certainly a place for telemedicine. It's, it's convenient. Um, you know, it's bite-sized, uh, just like fast food. <laughs> and fast food is not always good, you know, uh, if you look to uh, the long-term impact. Um, you know, but I see that there's definitely a need, certainly for rural America, uh, or even, you know, kind of suburbia where, uh, transportation is an issue, uh, cost is an issue, mobility is an issue. Uh, it, there's certainly ways we can harness that and turn it into good medicine. Uh, my fear, just part of being an old guy and part of being somebody who's looking at systems, is if we don't insist on a very high standard to begin with, we're going to get really sloppy really fast because uh, anyone could do it. Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and it's going to be, you know, it, it seems like every... Uh, drug these days has a 1-800 number you can call with no questions asked and in a nondescript package get this drug that's not really a doctor patient relationship you know and and you know i'm biased i'm a family medicine guy i think relationships matter um and and you can do it with telehealth but not as well what kind of advice could you offer to um students or physicians interested in being a military physician do it do it <laughs> you know it's the uh yeah, it is a, a wonderful way to pay for school, you know, number one. Uh, number two, I've known many military physicians that, you know, started in, transitioned out of the military and came back. And the reason they came back was the patient base. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you were, you know, uh, you know, let's admit it, it's, it's hard sometimes when you're taking care of patients that don't seem to uh, appreciate what you're doing. They might have ulterior motives, that kind of thing. You, you tend not to have that very much in the military. You know, the, these people want to get better. They want to get back to their unit. They, um, you know, their families are, you know, they're doing, you know, what military families do and supporting, you know, uh, and they, they sometimes have the hardest job because they have the, the least control. And so, um, you know, so if you want to feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself and bigger than just a job and, and have a shared mission, there's no place like the military you know, uh, at all. Yeah, and, and even financially, the, the pay gap that used to exist, yeah, it still exists a little bit, but not a lot. And into the primary care, as you get more senior rank, it, it's pretty competitive. Um, yeah, now what you will trade for that, you know, uh, you're gonna get all that feel good stuff, but you know, very uh, admittedly, you won't control your destiny. 
Uh, and, I, and I'm not talking about just deploying, going to war and all that, you know, because when that happens, you, the only thing worse than deploying is not deploying and then wondering how you would have done. Um, yeah, but my biggest anxiety when I was in the military is just, can I promise my kids that they're going to be in the same school next year? You know, and, uh, and I was spoiled. I didn't move that much at all. Um, you know, or some people, uh, they used to move every three years. And that makes it tough. Um, you're, you're uprooting your family all the time. And, you know, spouses, whether it's uh, him or her or, or, or both, uh, you yeah, know, they've got their own careers. They, you know, they want to you know, get professional development. You know, uh, I know my uh, my wife uh, is a speech therapist. You know, so it, can, you know, it was great that she could stay home when you know when the kids were young and needed her to do that. And we had the privilege of getting to do that. But it's also something that if we move, she could you know get a really good paying job uh, wherever we went. You know, and uh, but not everyone has that that luxury. You know, and not everyone marries someone who's willing to to be along for the ride. <laughs> You know, uh, and raise your kids when you're working all these hours. And, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate in that sense. Wonderful. So as a medical educator and physician, are there any specific insights you might offer to medical students as they prepare to be the physicians of tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say take care of yourself first. Um, but I'm not great at doing that. Uh, I, I think a lot of us preach that and we don't all do it. Um, you know, but I, I would definitely say, don't forget where you came from, you know, don't ever forget, you know, and if you start to enjoy, uh, success, however that's defined or prosperity, uh, do not forget where you came from. Uh, too many people do that and, and don't forget why you went into it. You know, we see these medical students when they're interviewing and, you know, it's all some version of, oh, I want to help people. I want to make the world better. You know, and, and yeah, of course you have to say that, you know, um, but there's got to be an element you meant it at one point. You know, it's, it's too hard to do just for, for the money because there's, there's better ways to make more money. You know, and so um, be altruistic, be, be a sap, you know, be vulnerable. Uh, I think if you, if you don't give authentic vulnerability to whatever you do, who are you? I mean, you, know, you, you want to be a person first. And so um, if you're having a hard time, share that with your peers. You know, and uh, people want to help you. you know, uh, and, and so I'd say you know, be your authentic person you know, uh, and be the person that you know, your parents or your grandparents or whoever raised you raised. You know, because uh, your name, that's that's the only thing you have that you have to be a steward of your entire life. You know, and so, uh, you know, if things go wrong, don't go with them. Yeah, you know, it seems like a, you know, just a saying, but, you know, I've had opportunities. You know, things go wrong, just don't go with them. You know, because if you do, you have secured your Wikipedia entry forever. <laughs> you know, and, you know, uh, and that, so that's as far as just kind of moral standing and and happiness. Uh, but as far as concrete advice is uh, seek guidance and let somebody know that you want to do something. You know, uh, another staple of any, you know, kind of grand rounds or keynotes or talks that I give uh, is I remember the one guy, Colonel Alan Chanishevitz, and he was a, um, uh, a guy a few years ahead of me in family medicine. And I was down at Fort Bragg and uh, I was engaged, but uh, Chris was still up in New, New Jersey. And uh, I was at Fort Bragg because, you know, home of the airborne, home of special operations. I wanted to get there. And uh, so I had time to kill at night. And so uh, they've got these things called boxing smokers, you know, where they basically take these young paratroopers, put gloves on them and with or without any particular training, put them in the ring and they start slugging. And it's uh, it's glorious. You know, <laughs> but I looked over and I, uh, I saw this person seemed to be a ring doctor. And I figured I'd introduce myself. And so I went over and I did. And, uh, and you know, he, he said, hey, uh, you know, why are you here at Bragg? And so, well, I, you know, someday I'd like to be in the 82nd, you know, as an actual paratrooper. You know, I'm not sure how to, uh, I'll ever do that. And he said, well, you know, you should probably talk to the division surgeon. And I, re I remember thinking, the division surgeon <laughs> of the 82nd Airborne Division? Like, how am I going to get an audience with him? And uh, he looked at me and he's like, you're talking to him. So then I'm like slowly coming to parade rest, you know, because <laughs> he was in a PT uniform, no rank. I didn't know who I was. And, uh, and, and he said, no, 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 you know, go back to being comfortable talking to me. Uh, and he said uh, the best advice that I've ever received. He, he's like, Kevin, people are fundamentally decent. They want to help you. 
But if I if you if you learn nothing else, learn this for me. Express the interest. Yeah, and so that's the one thing I would tell anyone is express the interest. All right. If you want to do something someday, you gotta let somebody know that you want to do it. You know, because uh, if if you know we have a, a student or a resident, how do we know that they want to do a fellowship or they want to do whatever or they want to you know do locum tenens? You know, we're both in positions to help them do all those things, but if they don't tell us, how are we gonna help them? You know, and so express the interest is probably if I had to say there's one nugget of pearl of wisdom as far as quote unquote advice, uh, that's it. Yeah, express the interest. That's that's great advice. So, um, so I'm going to change gears a little bit, and you touched on this um, about taking care of yourself. So what are some things that you do to sort of to take care of yourself and, and address well-being? And I was better at when I, when I was retired. You know, you know, I, I transitioned out of the military. They, they tell you don't say the word retired because it implies you're not working as hard, which is never the case, but, you know, uh, but, you know, but people do retire from the military, but, you know, we, when I transitioned from the military to, uh, to civilian, I, you know, worked down at GW, uh, a great job down there. Um, but what I did have suddenly that I had not had in 22 years of active duty is weekends. Yeah. That was kind of neat. You know, um, holidays, you know, uh, you know, it's a position you don't always get those. And um, and had a little bit extra, you know, income compared to before because I had a pension, and so uh, the one part of prosperity that I allowed myself to enjoy is uh, I joined a boat club. Oh, you know, and uh, yeah, various dumb things I've done in life. That was the the smartest thing. Is um, you know, I live near Annapolis and is you know, great boating capital. And every one of my friends who owns a boat said, Kev, whatever you do, don't buy a boat." You know, if you, if you if you want to just go to the end of the pier and like once a week take like four hundred dollars and throw it in the water, and you will get more satisfaction out of doing that than owning the boat. You know, and so I'm like, okay, enough people have told me the same thing. You know, but then I discover this uh, this new business model of of joining boat club, you know, where I don't own a boat, uh, but I have about forty or fifty of them at any given day I can use. Yeah, that you reserve. And so, you know, the way it works is you pay a little bit of, you know, you know like any kind of club, uh, upfront money. And then it's just, you know, kind of a monthly fee out of that, like a car payment. So not exorbitant, but you know, not nothing either. You know, certainly blessed that I can do it. Um, but, you know, um, the motto of the club is it's about time. Mm. And so the way it works is you go down, uh, you, you know, the dock ends help you get your, you know, people and your cooler on the boat then you know you go do your little boating activity and then you come back and you tie up and you toss in the keys and you walk away you know and so that's kind of cool you know and uh and they train you up obviously because they're boats they want to mess them up and uh and so uh, i do enjoy getting out of the water every once in a while now that sounds fantastic yeah yeah something you can do with the, with the family Mm-hmm. You know, you know, I wasn't going to start golf or you know, something like that. It take you know, it's more time away. Even even when I was in the busy, like kids were young phase. Yeah, you know, my wife and I, you know, all three of our girls dance, and they were in competitive dancing. That was kind of like their sport, and uh, and I wanted a hobby. You know, like, I don't really have a hobby, and I don't play golf. I don't play cars. I don't, you know, uh, and uh, so I took up photography because mm-hmm. uh, there's something I could do with the girls. You know, and so I then had to teach myself, you know, the basics of like, okay, I'm in a dark room shooting a brightly lit stage with girls that are in action and, you know, and there's hot spots of different lighting on stage. And it, it was, it was challenging, but it was something I could do that put me into family life, didn't pull me away from family life. Because as physicians, we are kind of challenged to come up with those minutes to hours anyway. And, and so that's just one way of enhancing it. That's great. Yeah, finding that balance. Yeah. And then one thing is you do have to have one thing that you hold sacred. You know, and, and for me, it was if the girls were on stage, mm. if they're performing. Yeah, you know, I guess I missed plenty of Christmases, missed birthdays, missed plenty of things. Uh, but the one thing that I uh, that I held sacred and that the president made me hold sacred is uh, if the girls were on stage, uh, I would not be doing that trip. You know, and... Um, you know, and uh, that's something that he, he's big on. You know, you got to choose something that's sacred and stick to it. And so that's the one thing I'm proud of. That's great. So it's the last question. 
after you are completed this tour, if you will, what's next? I have no idea. I, I, my, I have no secret uh, to, to uh, success because it's argue whether I uh, have success now or not. It's, uh, yeah, I'm busy, you know, but uh, I've never had a plan. Okay. Yeah, each job along the way, uh, I've just worked really hard to kind of kick butt at what I'm doing and then just have the push the believe button that someone's going to notice. Yeah, that's another thing I tell young officers because they, they, you know, see my military career. They're like, hey, how did, how should I, what move should I make? Like, if you're making moves, you're not being authentic, you know. And so, uh, you know, the, the secret is whatever job you have, bloom where you're planted, mm-hmm. you know. And and so, just you know, focus on serving whoever your boss is. Do a really good job, you know. And even if you're not doing a really good job, make an earnest effort, you know, because you're not going to be good at everything, you know. But you know, but try, you know. All these people come in trying to be slick, or I think it's become a cultural thing that. You know, you want to lean back, you kind of act like you don't really care, even if you do. Where'd that come from? <laughs> I want to know that you're trying hard. You know, and, and I, I'll take earnest over slick any day. And so uh, just earnestly work at what you're doing and, and somebody will notice. You know, and, and even if something bad happens to you, the part I didn't understand as, as a younger officer that I did when I became a senior officer is, you know, say you're a young captain or whatever the equivalent in the civilian world would be. Uh, and you know you got some colonel that's being mean to you, just being a jerk. The part that I didn't appreciate when I was a young person is the other colonels, the other senior attendings, they know that person's a jerk. Mm. And so if something bad happens to you, they're going to take care of you. You know they just want to see how you're going to deal with it. Do you take your lumps or not? Yeah, or do you you know whine and you know cry and that kind of stuff? And, and so. You know, I'd say that to answer your question, I have no idea what I'm going to do next, <laughs> you know, because I've never had a plan. You know, I just hopefully somebody will notice that I, I, I try real hard, you know, and I, uh, I achieve moderate success well, with, we a, certainly with, have. A, with a great team. <laughs> we yeah. certainly have. So, Dr. O'Connor, thank you so much for hosting us. It's been an honor and a privilege to oh, meet with totally you today and, and, and have you tour us around. Listeners will benefit um, from the valuable insights and sound advice that you've shared. And always, we wish you well, and um, we're grateful for the strong relationship you share with NYTCOM. And most importantly, thank you for your service. No, no, thank you very much. Uh, God bless America, and God protect our troops. Thank you.